what you call love was invented by guys like me to sell nylons. This video is brought to you by Mubi. Don Draper is the ultimate ladies' man. What about your friend? Jesus, Don, even in this place, you're doing better than us. But which lady does Don really love? There are the mistresses who let him express a side of himself he usually keeps hidden, the wives who show us how he wants his life to appear, and the platonic loves who mean more to him than a lot of romances combined. Beneath the superficial aspiration many viewers might feel watching Don's love life, imagining what it's like to have your pick of all these beautiful women, his romances serve an important story purpose. They reflect how we use our relationships to shape our ideas about who we are. I just like the way she laughs. And the way she looks at me. We can track the evolution of Don's identity through the women who come and go in his life. So here's our take on how the many loves of Don Draper paint a portrait of the man himself. What do women want? You know better than to ask. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell to get notified about all of our new videos. Don has a type. Man, I'm always hoping I was seated next to, well, someone like you. It can be hard to figure out what that type is, given the endless parade of all kinds of women passing through his life. But on closer inspection, his kryptonite is a melancholy brunette, whether she's deeply dissatisfied, grieving, or alienated. You might notice that this sounds a lot like a description of Dawn. So this tells us that through these trysts, Dawn is engaging with mirrors of himself. What do you want from me? You know. I know you do. You know everything about me. They're often secret or illicit nature. Arnie's on call Thursday or Friday. I'll leave a penny under the mat when he's flown the coop. Reflects how Don's true self is something he can't bring out into the open. The first is Rachel Mencken, and you could say she's the prototype when it comes to Don's preference for sad brunettes. I'm worried it's a fantasy. It's not. Even though the Don-Rachel romance is short-lived, it's framed as one of the defining loves of his life. Show creator Matthew Weiner has gone as far as to say that Rachel is the one. What he really wants is he wants Rachel Mencken, the one that got away, the life not lived. So why were these two so important to each other? Rachel is the first person to really see Don. But I do know what it feels like to be out of place, to be disconnected. There's something about you that tells me you know it too. When they meet in season one, both are passing by trying to disavow the parts of their identities that mark them as other. I'm American, I'm really not very Jewish. That identity is the same story as Don's identity. It's like, how do we become white? Their shared feeling of alienation due to their backgrounds allows Don to confide in Rachel in a way we haven't seen him do with anyone else. You told me your mother died in childbirth. Mine did too. She was a prostitute. But even though Don takes a big step in starting to open up to Rachel, he's not ready to do this fully. His secrecy and paranoia still win out. You know more about me than anyone. You won't even tell me what happened. The whole reason Don asks Rachel to run away with him is because Pete has just threatened to expose Don's identity, so he's acting out of fear rather than pure love. You don't want to run away with me, you just want to run away. Soon after their affair ends, Rachel gets married, and ultimately she dies young from cancer, which is an interesting similarity to two other key women in Don's life, Anna Draper and Betty Draper. At its core, Don and Rachel's relationship is a classic case of what might have been. Things come. Good things, but there's no future in them. It's a great love that's doomed by circumstance, timing, and fear of what society will think. The tragic potential of this love is captured in Rachel's discussion of the word utopia. The Greeks had two meanings for it. Utopos, meaning the good place, and utopos meaning the place that cannot be. With this line, the show raises an agonizing idea. What if the person you love but can't be with, the one who got away, is the great romance of many people's lives? 
In season 7, years after the affair has ended, it's implied that Dawn has been dreaming about her for most of the series. Maybe you dreamt about her all the time. Maybe. When Dawn goes to Rachel Shiva, her sister says, I know who you are. Suggesting that he loomed large in Rachel's mind, too. So, through this relationship, the show points out that the person you connect with most in an authentic way, or the one who moves your heart most deeply, sadly may not feature for much screen time in your life. This is it. This is all there is. I feel like it's slipping through my fingers like a handful of sand. Many of us, like Dawn, don't follow our hearts in that brief moment when we have the chance, and then spend the rest of our lives wondering or trying to recreate the lost opportunity with new people who remind us of that one who could have been. While Rachel speaks to the disconnected outsider in Dawn, his neighbor Sylvia Rosen gives expression to another part of his identity, his past. I knew it'd be you. The show links Sylvia to Aimee, a prostitute who worked at the brothel where Don grew up. In flashbacks, we see how Aimee mothers young Don when he's sick. Your mama don't know how to take care of nobody. But also takes his virginity. Because I took that boy's cherry. The complex dynamic he had with Aimee comes through in the oatmeal ad Don creates, where the woman inspired by Aimee appears to be the young boy's mother. Like M.A., Sylvia is a Madonna whore figure. She's a Catholic woman who comforts and cares for Dawn. So what do you do when I leave here? Get on your knees and pray for absolution. But they also have a very carnal connection. You want to feel shitty right up until the point where I take your dress off, because I'm going to do that. So this affair is Dawn's way of trying to rewrite the past of taking charge in this relationship with a woman who reminds him of Ame because he wasn't in control with the real Ame. And it has to do with what holds people together. What is that thing that draws them? It's a history. And it may not even be with that person. It's no coincidence that Don asserts this power with Sylvia while he's feeling impotent in his marriage to Megan. My storyline is getting more developed, and that means I'm gonna have a series of love scenes. Sylvia makes him feel needed again. He sees her arguing with her husband about money and later gives her cash. He calls in a favor to stop her son from being drafted, enjoying being the big hero who saves the day. But the most revealing episode in Don and Sylvia's relationship is when she tells him, I need you. But nothing else will do. These words drive Don wild. He even makes Sylvia repeat them when they meet at a hotel to have sex. I need you and nothing else will do." And they seem to trigger an even greater need for control deep inside him. From here on out, almost everything he says to Sylvia takes the form of a command. I want you to crawl on your hands and knees until you find them. Don't go anywhere. Don't answer the phone again. Don't ask any more questions. Take off your dress. This is about him making Sylvia into someone who can't desert him. You are for me. You exist in this room for my pleasure. Reminding us again of how his childhood trauma and fear of abandonment informed this and all of Don's relationships. When Sylvia ends their affair, Don gets desperate. He comes as close as Don Draper can come to begging. Please. Lurks outside her back door and keeps trying to restart their relationship. Please, just listen. As Weiner said, he could take or leave Sylvia until she rejected him. Sylvia was supposed to be someone he had total control over, but even in this rewriting of history, he couldn't possess her enough to cure his feelings of powerlessness and self-hatred. While we could buy into the romance of Don's relationship with Rachel, his affair with Sylvia is one of the lowest things he does. He's sleeping with his friend's wife right under the man's nose and brazenly lying to his own wife. Tell so Megan I'm going out for cigarettes, and I'm gonna knock on her door. So it's fitting that the Don Sylvia relationship ends in the most humiliating way possible. This creates another parallel to his encounter with Ame, because that relationship also ended in shame. <laughs> You're trash! <laughs> But it's significant that just two episodes later, we see Don come clean about his identity at work. I was an orphan. I grew up in Pennsylvania, in a whorehouse. And start opening up to his kids. This is where I grew up. He had to face the past and even relive parts of it in order to really commit to changing. What do you want for this year? I want to stop doing this. 
it takes another woman to reveal exactly how Don's affair with Sylvia has changed him. His relationship with Nev Campbell's character, who is unnamed on the show but credited as Lee Cabot, is one of the show's briefest. Their story lasts the length of a plane ride. This is nice. I usually sleep alone. But over these hours, they develop a deep emotional intimacy as this woman reveals that she's grieving her dead husband. I mean, we literally, let's said, let's build Don Draper's ideal woman, right down to the fact that she's, like, sad. He was thirsty. He died of thirst. There's a depth to that, to the grieving. That, that, that Don's attracted to. So it's a surprise when, at the end of the plane ride, Don decides not to take this fledgling romance any further. I'm sorry, but I have to go back to work. Weiner has said, quote, that woman has everything that Don Draper loves, and his resistance of her shows his attempt to recommit to his marriage and his attempt to become a better person in some way. I bet I could make you feel better. I bet you could. The mysterious waitress Diana is the final woman of Don's type with whom he has a significant relationship. Diana represents mourning what's lost. From their very first meeting, Don feels like he knows her. Do I know you? I don't think so. You look so familiar to me. Do I know you from somewhere? I think I know you. He meets Diana soon before learning that Rachel died, so it's almost like she's the ghost of Rachel. I had this dream about a woman I once knew. And I found out the next day she had just died. So who do you think I am? Diana really is the makeup or do-over Rachel, in that Don could realistically have a relationship with her. By now, he's separated from Megan, and the timing is right. You're not the first thing to come along. I'm ready. He and Diana forge a powerful connection over their shared experiences of loss. How long were you married? Twelve years. I don't know why I thought it'd be easy. It's never easy. But what stops this relationship from becoming more is that Diana is too damaged. The tragedy in her past has made her determined to cut all positive feeling out of her life. I don't want to feel anything else. So this woman is really a cautionary tale for Dawn. And you've never had a worse day than me. You don't think I've felt grief? Her story reminds him that he needs to push through the pain to become a better, happier version of himself. If we look at the similarities between Rachel, Sylvia, Diana, and Lee, we see that there is a spirit of a woman Dawn loves that manifests in each of them. This sad woman embodies the tragedy of his life, that he can't fully realize or connect to the person he is in a positive way. I pray for you. For me to come back? No. for you to find peace. If the women who fall under the umbrella of Don's type reflect who he really is, Don's two wives show us who he wants to be. Betty and Megan remind us that this is a key part of marriage, cultivating and presenting a certain joint image to the world. Are you two sold separately? <laughs> Look at you two. You're my favorite couple. As Don's first wife, Betty embodies the wasp elite that he aspires to be a part of. And she's from a good family and she's educated. The couple does achieve the suburban white picket fence ideal, but this beautiful image masks a deep dissatisfaction and emptiness they both feel. Bertie, you should eat. Stop it, Don. Nobody's watching. Don spends a lot of their marriage cheating on Betty and keeping secrets from her. He doesn't believe he's worthy of this woman's love. I was surprised that you ever loved me. He fears, correctly, that she would never be able to accept him as Dick Whitman. I could tell the minute she saw who I really was. She never wanted to look at me again. Which is why I never told her. And yet, on some level, he wanted her to discover the truth. You obviously wanted me to know this, or you wouldn't have left your keys. You wouldn't have kept all this in my house. Because he couldn't have a complete experience of love from a wife who doesn't even know who he is. 
After Don and Betty's divorce, Don briefly tries to replicate Betty's polished, upper-class pedigree with Bethany Van Nuys, who is essentially a young Betty Draper wannabe. But Don is bored by Bethany, showing that he's outgrown his interest in achieving that conventional ideal. Instead, he goes in a totally different direction by marrying his secretary, Megan Calvay, who represents a fresh start. The biggest reason Don falls for Megan is her idealized view of him. She helps him believe he's a good person as he emerges from the wreckage of his divorce. I know that you have a good heart. And I know that you're always trying to be better. On the surface, vivacious Megan is a stark departure from Betty. Zooby, zooby, zoo, zooby, zoo, zooby, zoo, Yet, this marriage is again Don's way of proving something about himself. Aligning himself with this young modern woman shows he wants to present as cool and with it as he enters middle age. I know why you're upset. You're 40. Sexy, liberated Megan is the envy of his settled friends. And to Don, you lucky so-and-so. And her talent for advertising suggests that, as a working woman, she'll be Don's intellectual equal. Kids want beans, and they have forever. Oh, I had something like uh, Heinz beans. Some things never change. Jesus, I think that's better. Yet, even though he enjoys the idea of Megan's free, hip lifestyle, he doesn't really like this openness in practice, as we see when he hates the surprise party Megan throws for him. I don't need to be the center of attention." So as much as he initially likes the image that his second wife helps him present, over time their private incompatibility becomes harder and harder to overcome. You kiss people for money. You know who does that? Don's marriages make it clear that our choice of spouse is often based on two things, the face we want to present to the world and the way we want to think of ourselves. I feel like myself when I'm with you the way I always wanted to feel." Don sabotages both his marriages, so this reveals that even if he succeeds at creating the perfect image of himself for a while, over time he himself can't buy into the lie, and that's why he can't accept his wife's love. That poor girl, she doesn't know that loving you is the worst way to get to you. The other women who show up in between these significant romances also reveal what's going on within Don at any given moment. He's with many, many other women over the course of the show, some for just one night, but we're going to talk about the ones who do stick around a little longer and have an impact on his life. The most common thing Don seeks in his mistresses is an escape. Midge, the first mistress we meet in season one, lives the antithesis of Don's and Betty's married life. She is an independent artist who isn't interested in a traditional cookie-cutter life. You know the rules. I don't make plans and I don't make breakfast. This is the appeal she holds for Don. She's like a reprieve from his day-to-day -day existence. I like being your medicine. In season three, Sally's teacher, Suzanne Farrell, intrigues Don with her free-spirited nature. Who are you? and becomes another vacation for him. So I can't stop thinking about you. Because I'm new and different. Or maybe I'm exactly the same. This woman is a breath of fresh air in his stifling suburban family life. And I look at your life, and even if I remove myself from the picture, I see a man who is not happy. In season two, Don's affair with his client's wife, Bobby Barrett, reveals that for him, sex is very much about power. This tryst is an escape of a different kind. It's all about releasing the darker impulses they can't act on in their normal lives. I like being bad and then going home and being good. Season four's Dr. Faye represents the potential for Don to have a healthy, mature relationship. They meet when he's a single man and she is his equal, an accomplished and intelligent professional woman who sees him clearly. He'll be married again in a year. What? I'm sorry. I always forget. Nobody wants to think they're a type. When they do start dating, they do it with their eyes open and their relationship has an emotional honesty that's been missing in a lot of Don's past love affairs. But I'm just gonna take you to your door. And why is that? Because that's as far as I can go right now. And I'm not ready. 
to say goodnight. But season four Don isn't ready to deal with his problems in a realistic way, which is why he chooses to dive headfirst into yet another escapist relationship rather than continue things with this more appropriate partner. And I hope she knows you only like the beginnings of things. Two of the most profound relationships Don has on the show are with women he's not romantic with at all. Anna Draper represents the power of unconditional love. I always felt that we met so that both of our lives could be better. She's different from all the other people in Don's life in a very significant way. From the first moment she meets him, she knows his secret. They thought I was him and he was me. I didn't think I was hurting anyone. Don spends so much of the series going to great lengths to hide who he really is, out of fear that people would reject him if they knew the truth. But loving, open-hearted Anna disproves that notion. I know everything about you, and I still love you. So his bond with Anna makes us realize that he's cheating himself out of a lot of love he potentially could experience by not being upfront with others. I've told you things never told Betty. Why does it have to be that way? Finally, Don sees his protege Peggy as a part of him. I see you as an extension of myself. Seemingly even more than he does his actual children. Like him, she enters the advertising world as an outsider and experiences a life-changing trauma. And she shares his exceptional talent and work ethic. When Don champions Peggy's career, Miss Olson. You are now a junior copywriter. And passes on his survivalist philosophy to her. Get out of here and move forward. These are gestures of love that he wishes someone had shown him. When Anna dies, Don sees a vision of her ghost. And as she looks down on Don and Peggy, it's like she's satisfied that Peggy is taking her place as the most important woman in his life, who also knows him completely, though in a different way. The only person in the world who really knew me. That's not true. When Mad Men ends, Don is a single man, probably not for long if his romantic history tells us anything, but his relationship status is a reminder that this story has always been about this ladies' man's journey with himself. Weiner has said that Don hugging Leonard in the finale represents love for yourself. They should love me. I mean, maybe they do, but I don't even know what it is. By showing compassion to this stranger, Don is really extending a hand to his inner Dick Whitman. So while Don Draper spends so much of the series searching for emotional fulfillment in other people, in the end, the love he needed most of all was his own. The only thing keeping you from being happy is the belief that you are alone. Hey guys, this is Alani, and today I wanna to talk to you about one of our favorite places to watch movies. Mubi. Mubi is a treasure trove of films from around the globe. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film, whether it's a movie you've been dying to see or one you've never heard of before. There is always something new to discover. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. So in this world where it's very easy to spend hours debating what you should watch, Mubi is like having a really cool friend with amazing taste in movies, making it so much easier for you. They feature hard to come by masterpieces, indie festival darlings, influential art house and foreign films, lesser known films by your favorite famous directors, and more. Plus, you can even download the films to watch offline, and there are no ads, ever. One movie you can check out right now on Mubi is The Dead, John Huston's final film which stars his daughter, Angelica Huston, and is based on a short story by James Joyce. The Dead follows a married couple reflecting on memories of first love. We can't recommend Mubi highly enough. You can try it out now for free for a whole month. Just click the link in the description below.